everyone. Thanks for coming. Um, yeah, we. That was a great introduction. Uh, the whole thing I was just explaining to um, Dr. Sanders here started in a brilliant way, in kind of by accident. So just to give you a five-second rundown on how it started, I used to be a lecturer, as you've just heard. And on one afternoon, a couple of my students said to me that they hadn't done so well on an exam because they found it very, very difficult to do something so different to do in the hospital as they do in um, a simulation environment. At around the same sort of time, I had some friends who were um, uh, developers, and they said, come and have a look at this virtual reality stuff we've got, stuff. And um, I said, all right, I'll have a look. And I said, all right, so I came down, had a look, and I was shooting bow and arrows into um, targets. And I said, well, this is pretty realistic. And I said, it's just code, right? Because coders like to hear that it's just code. <laughs> and um, they were like, yeah, you know, 18 months of 17 people working six days a week. But it is just code. So I said, cool, can you make me a hospital? And they said, yeah, we can. And I said, cool. So we started the company about two days later. And um, the, the whole principle is we can't do what we can do in virtual reality in any other environment. We do dangerous stuff like using radiation and or risky stuff like childbirth where you can introduce complications in a carefully um, carefully sort of controlled environment where you're, you're, you're grabbing the learner and you're taking them in a scaffolding way all the way through so that eventually they become an expert, they pop out into the real world and they really know what they're doing. The other really cool thing is um, the, the, the strong learning component behind this, again developed by accident because there's probably a lot of coders in the room, and as you know, to move a very realistic avatar is quite expensive. So we were having a situation where we were developing very realistic um, medical imaging simulation. And um, we, said, we said, well, we've got to ask the student how you want the patient to start off. There's three basic, basic ways. You've probably all had an x-ray at some stage in your lives. You can either be sitting on a chair, lying on a table, or standing up. So said, rather than having the avatar in the middle of the room for every beginning, let's ask the student in some sort of a 2D platform, how do you want your patient to start? And if they say lying down, we say, do you want them on, your, on their back or their front? And if they say sitting, we say, do you want them in the middle of the room or by the wall? And all of a sudden, we realized we were splitting what the students were saying and changing the environment, and we were like, have we just kind of developed adaptive learning? And so that became known as the three questions, and we've kept this in. It's a little bit of an in-joke, and it's kind of amusing if you're us. Um, so now we've got these hugely, yeah, thank you. Um, we've got these hugely complex platforms in order to teach students. So we actually find out what they know. And we do this by turning it all around, asking questions at the beginning, and then t teaching what they don't know. The other reason this is so important is, well, if I take this room, you've all got different backgrounds. And if I was to say to you, you have to stand here or sit there and listen to this entire day, some of you, international evidence will have shown, will be asleep in six minutes. And that's an average, so some of you have already gone, which means I can actually just say what I want now. Um, the average means some of you will be here for about 12. And the rest of you are sitting there wondering what you'd do if you won the lottery. So um, if we take it to let's find out what you don't know, and in a blended learning environment, adapt the course to suit you, you can reduce the time, reduce the costs, and teach people what they want to know. So that's what I'm going to talk about. Um, got a cup of coffee and an iPad there. We're going to talk about adaptive learning and why this needs to be asynchronous. It's not a font issue. Someone asked me, they were like, seriously, you didn't even do the correct font? And I put enjoyable in smaller letters because if you get adaptive and asynchronous, you get enjoyable just as a freebie. And then I'll talk a little bit about technology, but I'm not going, I'm kind of like, you know, I'm aware that in this environment, I'm not the tech guy. Um, and we'll talk about analytics because that's so important. Um, in 1912, there was a book written called Education by Edward Thorndike. And it basically says, I'm not going to read it, I hate people who read PowerPoint slides, but it basically says you can't read page two unless you understand page one. And that's so important. That's what education is about. So what this is our three questions, OK? Um, everyone starts at the orange dot. 
so that's where the student logs in, or and we've applied this into non-university, so this is just training now. Everyone starts at orange, they're kind of like the traffic lights, except that analogy doesn't work in New Zealand because orange means speed up. Um, <laughs> overseas, orange means you're not quite ready, okay? And green means you are ready. So if you look at it like everyone logs in at one, now, if I was teaching you about medical imaging, which is where we started, and I, I'm not sure of all of your backgrounds, obviously, but I think I would probably be okay at this in this group. So I might take a very linear platform and um, go, well, it doesn't matter, you can see a fairly straight, a straight line across. Now, I'd end up at dot 17, the green one. Someone who has a very strong... Um, maths or physics background might bounce around a little bit more but still end up at 17 and that's really important. We started at the same pl place, we ended at the same place, so really from an educator's point of view I don't care and it's not I don't care because if I didn't care I wouldn't have bothered but um, I don't mind how much you have to do. Now the good thing is the learners don't know that they're bouncing around and they might do 15 modules or they might do 10 so unless you log on and you're adjacent to someone who's doing a slightly different course to you, it doesn't matter, and people love it. There's a couple of red dots. Now, even New Zealand, that usually means stop, okay? And what happens there is that means the software can't fill the gap, and you say, right, so the, um, you'd get put into, you, you know, your lecturer might get an email, or, and the student would get an email, say, look, there's a tutorial running on, when, on Thursday, um, we really think you should go along to it. So we're not saying this just replaces all lecturing staff by any stretch of the imagination, okay? The whole thing about blended is it doesn't. I want to tell you what it's not, because I, I sort of tell people what it is. It's not this. This is a course. Everyone starts at one side and they finish in the other. The same material in the same order and the same experience, okay? Which means that if one of you had a master's in physics and I was teaching you undergraduate physics, you'd sit there, again, thinking about what you'd do if you won the lottery, which wouldn't be sitting in one of my physics classes. But you would be able to go in a very quick way, whereas if someone else had a background in human anatomy, they might bounce around a bit more of the physics course, and actually, especially if you had a background in chemistry, because you have to unlearn some of that. The other thing we don't do is ask straightforward multiple choice questions, because this just shows you, well, it might be a 50-50 or it might be a 33%. Worst case scenario, or best case scenario, you've got a 20% you know, chance of guessing. Could you play that animation for me? I was the tech guy's nightmare and I changed everything this morning. So I came in here and I said, oh, I, I want to do something different. Um, so if you ask someone 10 questions, okay, and this is kind of where, um, oops. Sorry, I'm, can I ask you to click through? So if you, because I don't have a keyboard now. If you click, I'm not the tech guy. Um, so that's usually where uh, education stops. You say you got 70%, well done. And everyone's pleased with that. They've got a few wrong, but you know, they're mainly right. Could you go on to the next one? Add a weighting to your question, okay, and again, please. And we find out that some questions are worth more. And then if you advance that one more. So we add them in. And actually, the really uh, interesting thing is that the student has no longer got 70%, but 50%, which would be an interesting place to stop. But as soon as we had three questions we were going to ask every student, we decided we'd go on a bit and we'd add in uh, a confidence level. So could you uh, just do one more? We find out that they guessed a couple of these questions. And the real answer, one more, and then you can turn it off, I think, um, is they got three out of 10. Okay, now that's really useful to know. Um, and it goes the other way, of course, as well. So if someone got the three, three questions they, they, that was really important, if they got them right, you're like, well, we're gonna put you in a much higher category. And it's not a case of, I guessed right, you guessed wrong, therefore we get different answers. So could, oh, well, thank you. Um, so this is what we do. I kind of showed you the actual back end of it before, but it, it's a personalized thing. So, you know, you log in, the, this stream this morning, if anyone was at the workshop, was all on machine learning and artificial intelligence. It has that element in the background. It gets better the more it knows you, okay, which is quite cool. It's data-driven. It's able to find out what you don't know and then 
the software fills the gaps. Now that's really important because if you say in an education um, point of view, if, if you have mentioned this to any lecturer, they will say they don't want any more time um, spent giving feedback and stuff like that. That is a huge thing. The other thing they don't want to know is that they will be completely without a job. So we sort of sit somewhere in the middle. We like to think we're in the Venn of the Venn diagram. And um, it, what it does is it allows the software to give what I would call the lower level feedback to a student. They get videos sent to them. They can get a PDF. They can get a link to an article. But then they get to the red dots. And it says, actually, you need to go to the tutorial. So it's not just about getting rid of everyone and teaching on an iPad. It's far more important than that. It's getting a top level education and everybody getting their own education. It, and it, like I said, it changes. It's completely driven by data. So if, if you log in, it remembers your strengths, it remembers your weaknesses, and it improves from there on. Um, it gives universities and training organizations um, a competitive advantage because it's cheaper than um, having this uh, uh, created every time for every student. And people like it, OK? So it's quite important. I mentioned asynchronous. Uh, it just means do it at your own time. And if I think about, I taught for 10 years. And during that time, I went from having all of my students who were 21 to having a bunch of my students who were mature students and who are coming back to education. Now that's great, but the difference in, in them is a mature student will A, respect your time a lot more, but also they might have kids, they might have a part-time job, they might be looking after um, a parent or something like that who has Alzheimer's, that's a specific case. So they have different things. They can't turn up to universities um, nine to fives. And also, if you think about it from a corporate training environment, we've all been sent on those, you know, the, the day out and you it's a little bit of a junket and it can be an okay lunch but it, it's invariably inconvenient I've just lost all no I've got a back thank you um, it can be a little bit frustrating that you've got to spend an entire day with an out-of-office email going on and you say I would much rather be able to do some of this in my own time if I drag it back to what the human attention span is of about six minutes has anyone done a MOOC Massive online open course. Yeah, the, the, quite a few of you have. I, um, I was doing one on gamification a couple of months ago, and I was really disgusted with myself because they, the course design was phenomenal. They had six minute videos and stuff like that, so there it is, sitting in your human attention span. But they'd um, occasionally they'd stop the video after about two minutes, and they'd ask you a question on something the speaker had said. Not a difficult question. It was just like in the previous sentence. And I was just like, I don't know, I'm going to have to. And it's like, so, I, OK, my limited defense, this was probably 9.30 at night. But it, you know, a day of lectures doesn't do an awful lot for you. Training in small sort of like cappuccino shots works really well for most people. So you let people log on, do their stuff, bring them in for tutorials when they need to. But it's got to be in their own time. I said you'd get the freebie and it's enjoyable. It just, just is. If you mix all of these methods up, you've got some digital learning. I don't like the word e-learning because um, it's just been done so badly for so long. We dump PowerPoint slides onto some sort of learning management system and say that's e-learning. It's not. It's just a disk. Um, but also, your time is really important. It's important that we make every moment that you come in to listen to us as trainers um, count. I said I'd mentioned technology. I'm also not the tech guy. I'm very aware of that at a conference like this. This is what we've done in the last 100 years. We've changed the color of the board, <laughs> OK? We've gone from a blackboard to a whiteboard. The only disappointing thing about that is your teacher can't throw chalk at a student. Um, the pens are far more expensive. But the, um, we've gone from books to e-books and an overhead projector to a PowerPoint projector. It's a didactic thing. If you want to look about changing um, your pedagogy, you, then you start to say things like, we're going to bring in different types of learning paradigms. 
One of them that we use a lot, as you might have guessed with the name, is virtual reality. I mentioned very briefly at the beginning that this is a way of doing difficult things safely. And we can then, you see, bring in the metrics. There's no amount of watching. If I was watching a student do an operation, I can't watch them as well as the computer can. If I watch 30 students in a day, which is a very real uh, possibility, there's a few students after lunch who I know don't get a good assessment. And that's because I'm sitting there and I, where are that pigeon thrown by? And then I look back and I think, right, they've been going for 15 minutes. They've probably done this, that, and the other. Computers don't forget. And they mark what you're doing all the time well. So you use it for dangerous things, and you use it for things you can't do very easily. Like I said, we, we can't do it with radiation. We can't do it with childbirth. We want to have a student going in to a maternity ward, delivering a baby in virtual reality in a completely healthy, natural way. And then all of a sudden, we're like, oh, we're going to introduce a little bit of complication. Something simple to begin with, like a raised blood pressure. What do they do? Then you start to sort of you know, increase this level, increase it, increase it, increase it. All of a sudden, you've got an expert practitioner. Five minutes to question time. Cool. So virtual reality is important, OK? Um, don't trap students behind desks. They will go to sleep. Um, to ensure the student learns the correct exposures, this is what we, we do. disable the presets for this procedure. Please set an exposure for a mortise ankle view. Used Please reality, position the you know X-ray tube at 100 centimeters this. and center to the joint. Please collimate to the area of interest. Please adjust the foot and ankle to correctly image the mortise joint. What about a side marker? All of this is being tracked. I know her confidence level. Her, it's me. Um, I know exactly what's going on in there. If they change things around, I can tell. As you have previously set an exposure, prep and expose. Now you can't do that in a real environment. Are you happy with your image? I can deliberately let the students make mistakes and correct them later on. Um, the analytics are incredible behind this because you want you, you want to find out what's going on behind your students' thinking. Okay, we give them dashboards right from the word go, so they can find out um, pretty much anything they want. I won't go through it in great detail. I haven't got a lot of time. The only thing that the CFO would be interested in is per student you save twenty four dollars a day. Um, the students are interested in pretty much everything else. So that's our whole platform. We start off with some e-learning. We then do some virtual reality. And then taking those first two circles, we put the information and the analytics we've gathered in that back into the third circle. And we ask them for some, we give them feedback and we ask them further questions. And then because I'm not a marketer, I haven't got a name for the fourth circle. So there's a prize of a t-shirt saying virtual medical coaching on the back. Uh, if anyone can come up with a name for me. Because we then text the students some information of, um, on their own individual learning. Like, we never say it's ended on a Friday or a Saturday night, because we don't want nonsense in return. But um, <laughs> we, the, the software just sends them in, you know, little bits of information, so they're continually learning this stuff. It, they, never, they never forget it. Um, look, that's all I've got to say. Thank you very much for listening. I'm happy to take some questions. That's good, because we have a big, long list of them. Oh, right. <laughs> All right, so the um, most um, upvoted question is, did anyone do something entirely unexpected for the system? <laughs> yeah, so we went through six months of usability um, with professional usability testers. And then the first time the students got access to it, we had to change the model by putting underpants on him. Um, <laughs> because he was too lifelike, apparently. Um, <laughs> The other thing we noticed was they said, if you point the x-ray camera at the window, a light shines on the ceiling. And I said, why would you ever point it at the window? They said, well, we were just testing it. And I said, OK. So um, if you're ever looking for cheap usability, you call Hell's Pizza, um, and you get about 30 students down, and they'll just mess around and get great things done.
Very cool. Uh, what other risky or dangerous markets do you think this could be applied to? Um, so much in medicine. Uh, chemistry, um, health and safety. You can go into a building site and you could have a person wearing the goggles and they're expected to identify five things or ten things. It doesn't matter. Or just an un And this is actually the clever thing. Don't tell them they've got to identify five things. You say, you have to identify things. So they think, well, maybe there's three, maybe there's five. This is something that came up in our um, questioning. Um, Multi-choice questions, as you know, have one answer for the possible four. But they shouldn't. They should have either none, or one, or four, or three. And the student shouldn't know that. And they should just tell you what they think the answer is, and then justify it. And that's how you can use multi-choice correctly. Um, how would you adapt it to different curriculums in an education setting? Um, well, this was, this was why we actually split it. So the e-coaching side of things is a standalone module. And then that sends little, um, that sends the data to the virtual reality side of things. So whatever you do in the e-learning, your results get popped through into virtual reality. So you can create a new VR platform and then just clip it on. So there's a question here about what tools and equipment you're using for VR, but um, also will you see HoloLens coming in? Yeah. HoloLens isn't there yet, it will be, and we can't wait until it. It's got a very different application. Um, presumably the entire audience knows the difference between AR and VR. It's uh, virtually, uh, it's probably selling coals to Newcastle, but uh, this did come up before. Uh, virtual reality is an entirely different environment. Augmented reality puts uh, uh, a new environment over existing things. So the HoloLens is augmented reality. That would be good. It doesn't solve one of the problems we wanted to in virtual reality in that universities and most training organizations don't have much space. So once you turn off the virtual reality, you're now in a situation where you have a, a free room and you can teach English as a foreign language or business studies after um, five o'clock when the, you're not using the simulation unit. What was the first part of that question again, sir? Oh, uh, <laughs> you know what technology are you using? Oh, we use the HTC Vive. We've w those of you who are old enough to remember, and it doesn't look like there's many of you. Um, the Betamax HT, um, Betamax and VHS thing. We didn't want to get into a situation where there was going to be this. Oh my goodness, you use the HTC. The code, as most of you will know, can be very easily changed. So um, we use HTC Vive at the moment. Oculus could come next, or who knows, you know. Who do you sell the product to? Uh, mainly universities, but the B2B market, the Siemens, <laughs> uh, some large companies who, um, <laughs> um, some large companies who uh, want to model their own equipment to use in sales and marketing and actually education approached us and said, um, we would really like you to work for us. What are some of the hazards? <laughs> well, we had to go through this hazard thing for our um, board of directors meeting recently. So you could walk into someone who's in a virtual reality environment and doing this. Uh, you could trip over a cable. We've just gone wireless. Uh, the hazards are actually more or less non-existent. Do you have any haptic feedback? Yes. And you need it. That was one of the. That was really the only reason we went to the HTC Vive, and that if anyone's out there looking to get into sort of like really hard on development of um, new hardware, we want good hands because that's the thing that's holding us back from surgery at the moment. So um, the stuff that's out there is good, but it needs probably another generation. We're at the iPhone five. What do you see as some of the pros and cons of long-term community? Um, it's. It's like I sort of said about the blackboard to the whiteboard. It's not a new technology. It's a new paradigm, if anything. You're using a different type of education. So whether virtual reality is here in five years' time, I think it will be. People sort of say, oh, it'll be replaced by this. And it's like, well, we'll call it extended reality then. Something is going to be around in that space. And it'll, be, it'll take the place of learners doing something very, very realistic in an environment that's not actually there. Call it what you want. How long did it take to develop a steady 
Uh, started on the 17th of December 2015. I went to Brazil two days later and apparently it was a bit of a pain in the ass because I wouldn't stop talking about it. Um, and then we were in our first university in January this year. So uh, a while. But it was a new, like, to, to invent the physics. Like when I was, when I said to the developers, you know, I said, um, you know, you can shoot arrows at a target. And I said, cool. So when I said I wanted a hospital, I said, I want something a little bit more complicated than that. I said, imagine I wanted to accelerate an electron across a vacuum, have it striking a tungsten target, and then change direction, go through a body that isn't there, and then create a, an image on a screen. None of that's there. Can you do that? And they were like, oh, uh, that's different. So we got a physics guy in. And um, yeah, we had it. What are some of the challenges you found? To the students, uh, zero. But, but to um, to the lecturers, why are you changing it? We've done it this way for a hundred years. Some of them might have actually have done it for a hundred years. How <laughs> 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 unkind! Um, but yeah, it was just the why do you need to do it differently? It's worked like this for so long. You're like, has it though? Show me the data. Yeah, yeah. How big's the tank? <laughs> well, we spike for development, and we're lucky enough to have really good relationships with Cerebral Fix, and I see a couple of the guys sitting in the audience. And um, so we use Cerebral Fix, and we've got a JV with Skeletics, so that when we are in a development mode, we have access to some phenomenal developers. Um, our team is only four. Wow. Yeah. Well, I'm actually two, because I don't sleep anymore, <laughs> but, you know. <laughs> So there's a bunch of other questions, but we run out of time. Yeah, I understand that.